My name, my name is Jeremy, and uh, Charlotte is here with me as well. Uh, we're both dietitians here in NICU, uh, another basis. Uh, we're going to be talking to you today about some common nutritional practices that we see and do in the NICU. Uh, we have no disclosures, uh, just a bunch of other pictures we decided to share. Okay. But what we're going to go over is we hope this will be more discussional and informal rather than a strict presentation. Uh, we're just going to go over a case study of a little girl named Carly, uh, born at 26 and two weeks, uh, 700 grams at birth. Uh, we'll kind of follow her throughout her stay in hospital from a nutrition perspective. Uh, stopping at various kind of points where we make most of our interventions and uh, we'll just open it up for questions and discussion throughout. Um, but what we have is a, 20, a little girl, Carly, as I mentioned, 26, uh, 26 and two weeks, 700 grams, 24th percentile, AGA. Um, I didn't include a head circumference or length, but assuming that's appropriate as well. Mom's a 25 year old G1P0, uh, delivered by C section, APGAR scores were six, seven, and nine. Um, Otherwise, unremarkable IV access, uh, what we always ask for, but she has a double lumen BBC in her arterial line. So, once you're thinking about stabilizing this patient, what are, what are the first steps that we uh, consider to begin uh, providing uh, nutrition to her? I mean, uh, so yeah, from the IV foods my, my perspective, which was we are used to, which is 50-50. I mean, uh, starter and I mean TPN and the D10W. I think the D10W here will provide around three to four milligram per kg per minute, which is like if we go with the 80 milliliter per kg per day. If you if it's running, if you're is you also have if you mentioned TPN, that will be your start solution. Yeah. But that will give you about four grams per kilo of dextrose. Okay. Um, which would be about two, three milligrams per kilogram per minute, plus your D10, but you also have the R1, which would be taking up some of that risk. So you would be getting a little bit more, a little bit less than what you think you would. Okay, so I think we will not exceed the five milligram per kg per minute. Probably just a little bit. Okay. What, what else other than sugar and TPM? So protein and sugar are the first, I think, 12 hours, 24 hours are the main things uh, until we start like the official TPN and starting the lipid component. But before we start to feed, yeah, what do we need? What is the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were have, we have a baby just yeah. born, and we're asking what are the nutritional considerations, like in that first like day day of life. Is that TPN, that basic starter, that D ten or art line? Okay, so if you are given basic starters uh, like starter solution, so you will give a uh, Take 52 milligram per kilo of protein for the TV. And it is it contains 10 and D10. Yeah. So you can calculate the rest. Usually 25 liters should be 80 per kilo. Yeah. 40 is D10 uh, on a feed, 40 is the starter solution. And uh, usually I'm just remembering we are not giving any dividend in that period, I guess. You know, if it's a personal electrolyte, it's no better than this. Yeah, so I have it like until the new TPN comes. Yeah. So if it is the case, um, that baby is getting how many milligrams per kilo of per uh, minute? This one baby has an arterial line going one cc an hour. Yeah, so it would be usually if you if it's full 80 per kilo D10 plus starter solution, probably be glucose fusion is about five. It might be a little bit less than that because of yeah, yeah. your line. That should be okay. But, but other things to consider than TPN and things that are what about mom's milk supply? What are we going to feed? And yeah. so hopefully, this is all done antenatally with mm -hmm. those consults. Those discussions you had whether mom finds out breastfeeding, she finds out expressive milk. Um, but what about donor milk too? This baby needs a donor. Yeah, and then and we have five days uh, because of, uh, it should be 25 acres. 25 acres? 26. 26 and yeah, it could, could be around like kilo. 700 grams. 700 grams. The hydrogen? 24 percent up. Okay, so yeah, the donor breast milk for sure. And we have five days. 
the, the, so the discussions to be had with mom prior to delivery after delivery. Um, but usually the way we do it, if they consult you before delivery, you tell them you get consent for the DBM, then it's documented. Yeah. Then when uh, when mom delivers again, whoever is uh, attend the delivery can still like update mom about DBM. You can talk to the one else about it, and most of them will say yes. Characterizing, re-emphasizing colostrum. Yeah. Don't yeah. throw it out, even if there's like no. Yeah, every yeah, yeah, so brief, yeah. 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 Yeah, or on your therapy too, even if we're not, we're yes. not, not even if we're the baby, yeah. just put two mils bilaterally in the mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm gonna, since we're talking about that now, I'm gonna throw in, because this is our epic uh, presentation that we did uh, with the Colossum collection kits. So, this, have you provided these to families? No, 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 there's a bin of them in the center desk. There's a bin there. They look like this. Um, they're in the NICU. They're on the baby unit. Mm -hmm. Basically, anywhere there's a baby in the unit area, there should be one of these. Um, the reason I wanted to take a minute is because our documentation of providing them is very, very low. Mm -hmm. extremely like two patients in a month is uh, being documented. What, what so I know it's like the nurses should be doing them, but if you're there, just you can try to remember it. Mm -hmm. Just give the family the kit. Like why these uh, two different syringes? Yeah. So this leaves. So inside there's an education piece. So it's a how to hand express, which is the best way to get out your colostrum, like right away. Then this is a QR code on how to do hand expression, and then on the back side is the how to label it. Yeah, so that's why this is applicable for all babies in the HSC, and then this part is the NICU part. And then this is where they would collect and label their information. Why is it two different colors? Like, is it because the amount of the color? Oh, yeah, yeah, this just uh, that's the one ml syringe, and that's the uh, six ml syringe. Okay, to be completely fair, every delivery we go to, this is handed out. Yeah, and maybe it's just not documented. Yeah, they, they do a very good job at and yeah, it can be recorded on the golden hour checklist or on the research one. Well, and sorry, for those of you watching remotely, Charlotte's just showing a uh, colostrum collection. If you want to see these, just uh, swing by our office at any point. Um, for this, um, for all we, we know. Um, so, like, uh, it's independent from the near, right? Yeah. Regardless, maybe it's getting in or not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost not a contraindicated at all. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, even if you're not giving any advocates, you have to give OIT, or you can still technically give OIT. Yeah, and most of the surgeons, like Dr. Scheuer, um, like most of all the surgeons will say, yeah, give OIT, even if NPO gets or sees whatever. Anna, can we give OIT? Oh, of course, absolutely. But first things first, do, does mom find the pump? Does she have the cross inflection kit? Can we get milk from her? Because uh, that would obviously be the best thing. Um, or we're stuck getting going milk consent, which we should be getting anyways, just as a backup. Uh, I always like to have a contingency plan in case mom does not have milk. Are we giving donor milk or are we giving any formula, particular formula best for the patient? Uh, next thing we're considering starting to the end, um, and then once that's all established, then we're also with these being stable, ideally within the first six hours, um, and then establishing milk milk supply. So we, I know when we get donor milk consent, we like to be very thorough, uh, but just kind of an outline of roughly the things that we touch on, maybe to a more simplified extent with the, the families, but. Uh, we say we get the milk from a milk bank within uh, Canada. It's the Northern Star Milk Bank out of Calgary. We do have the milk depot here in Winnipeg that we are affiliated with. And I am told that milk that is donated from Winnipeg comes back to Winnipeg. So babies in the NICU here can get local milk. Um, but for moms to become an approved donor, this is usually, well, who, where am I getting milk from? Who are these mothers? Uh, they have to be approved by a physician to be in good health. Uh, they screen medication, supplements, lifestyle, uh, medical history. Um, 
things that may or are contraindicated to donation are uh, frequent alcohol consumption, marijuana use, e cigarettes, uh, vaporizers um, of alcohol, their place. Um, they're also verbally screened by the milk bank. Um, I think it's over the telephone. Uh, they have to also have to get blood tests, HIV, uh, human T-lymph virus, virus, hepatitis, syphilis. Um, but now once they're fully approved, then they're allowed to donate their milk. There is a minimum amount they have to donate, uh, but once they do receive it, it's analyzed uh, for viruses and things, um, pasteurized. They do pool multiple mother's milks together just to get more of a, uh, a generalized sample. Uh, in case one mom has very high fat content, the other one doesn't. Uh, they reanalyze it again, just to make sure it's safe. Uh, they freeze and then sell it to hospitals all across Canada. Um, I have a many question about freedom. Are Canadian donor breast milks are Canadian or just uh, because I like recently I heard like not I heard I just I read an article about that um, in here or in the US most of them are coming from the middle income countries they are donating and they are selling the milks like uh, yeah it's kind of like a from uh, some kind of commerce commercialization is happening. Yeah, this, this, one. this one, I think, it's not not for profit. None no, of this, the yeah. this, this, this is a okay. Nana certified milk bank, Human Milk Bank Association of North America. Mm -hmm. They have a set of guidelines that they follow those guidelines, and the, those milk banks are not for profit. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, companies like Prolacta Biosciences, where we do get our Prolacta from, those are for profit companies, mm -hmm. and they do financially mm -hmm. the not, they're not paying anything. Mm -hmm. no. Others are no. not paying anything. It's just out of their, their own. Mm -hmm. okay. And it does go as far as saying, like you're asking about other countries, it says even if you've lived or visited, uh, it says UK, France, Europe, Ireland, Europe, uh, between certain years. Uh, the government, if I will, uh, it's craziness, madness. Yeah, then you're not allowed to. I don't know if it's specifically just Canada, but you can always ask Jeanette about that or ask. Hi, that. Charla, sorry to interrupt. So far, I know in Canada is all. Donated milk, it is not uh, sell by dollar. But in USA, so far I know one ounce is one dollar kind of thing. They are selling the uh, donor milk. But in yeah. Canada, it's all donor, right? There is no payment with the milk, just donation. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah, yeah. just the donation. Yeah. yeah. We, we do pay for it. We do. Yeah, we do pay for the fund. But the parents are donating to the. Uh, Donor best milk bank, you know. Yeah. 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 Pure, pure donation. Yeah. And we actually had a lot of our families that have donated. Like most recently, a baby who passed away, the mom had a lot of milk and she went through the process. We actually transported her milk. And then she actually just called us last week and wanted to give a special thanks to Carly because she got the approval and her milk is now going to be shipped back to us. Yeah. Uh, but one other question we do get asked, not very frequently, but from some parents is, what is the vaccination status of the donating mother? Is there a COVID vaccine or any other kind of vaccine in the milk? We don't know that. Uh, if anything, that is a potential benefit to the baby, but if mom was vaccinated, but um, they don't track vaccination status of the donating mother. Yeah. Jeremy, is that relevant? It's a question that we've been asked a few times in the past. Hmm. The couple of the families were um, not wanting any vaccinations. So those were the two most recent families. They declined donor milk because of the potential for the donating mums to be vaccinated. And uh, Jeremy and Sharla, do you know like which what's the profile of these mothers who donate? Are they within like the few months after delivery or like what's uh, like do you, do we have that information? Yeah, the milk can't be any more than a year old. Yeah, so it has okay. to be a year from the due delivery date of that baby. Like okay. within the year, they can't be older than a year. So we wouldn't be using anything in the hospital as expressed before this time last year. For babies with the CMPA that are within that time period of DBM, would you, and let's say we, Consider diagnosis of uh, CMPA. We don't know what mom's side doing that is. So, would we just go to for email or do we just stick with EBM? 
Because I've been asked that question, you will follow. So you asked about that question. Yeah, that means, yeah. Yeah, that one, um, we, the mom would have a full diet. Like, and it, again, like the milk would be cooled too. So mm -hmm. even if a mom wasn't following or was following a milk free diet, it's cool with other moms. Okay, so so it, be that it would be safer to just purely or like a more hydrolyzed drink. The daughter milk also isn't a long term solution. So think of duration of stay in hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and uh, just like, well, sorry. Uh, and is this exclusively used in preterm babies? Are there any other patient population where it's being used right now? I want to say yes. I mean, we there's always the uh, gray area in our donor milk guideline. We do have the statement at the discretion of the attending physician. Uh, and I think those are, that's a valid statement because we do have those term HIE, uh, really traumatic deliveries. We're really worried about uh, the integrity of the GI tract. I think that's a valid case. I believe other hospitals do the same. Um, there was a conference down in Texas just earlier this uh, last last week, I think it was. Uh, they were kind of having the same discussion. Yes, they used donor milk and all their premises, but there is always the gray area. I don't think any PICUs or children's hospitals use it. I'm not entirely sure if Stoller uses it either in their uh, cardiac unit. Oh, mm -hmm. but they don't use it. I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't say yes or no comment. Because some people are worried about the perfusion antibodies for cardiac baby as well. So, and I think we use it for our babies, the cardiac yeah. baby. Yeah, for our yeah. cardiac. Yeah. And for our gastroschisis babies, correct? Yes. Gastroschisis, I don't think we use them for our stuff. It's more of a clean. No. Device. Just gastroschisis. So now that we have the, the feeding sorted out, uh, we're going to start TPM. We've talked a little, a little bit about this already. Um, typically, in a normal patient, we would wait a few days uh, just because the, those patients would have the nutritional stores. Um, but multiple reasons why we start TPM kind of prophylactically in this group is because uh, we, I think we all know rapid feeding is associated with an increased risk of neck. Um, and considering how long we'll be doing MEF, usually at least three to five days, uh, plus our protocols last another five days under ideal circumstances. So that's at least a week to 10 days right there. The baby will be receiving inadequate nutrition. Uh, that combined with uh, the poor baseline nutritional stories of these pa uh, this patient and the high requirements, we do start TPM right away. So that's why we do have the basic start solution. 10% uh, dextrose, 5% amino acid will give you about uh, two, a minimum two grams per kilo of uh, amino acid. Uh, plus at least four grams per kilo of dextrose, uh, along with the D10, you'll likely also providing uh, just no, no vitamins, electrolytes, minerals, uh, nothing like that. Uh, the only other nutrient they may be receiving would be probably a little bit of sodium from the RYI uh, and maybe some acetate too. Uh, just keep close, uh, close eye on the sugars. Um, and then once we do round on them, I think we should, the first opportunity we get, we can get a, get a customized bag of TPN from uh, sterile pharmacy uh, to come up at about 1800 that day, which is used over 24 hours. So again, already mentioned the oral immune therapy. Um, it's just small drops of uh, mom's milk. I don't think we consider using with donor milk or even for one, just because the lesser amount of the immune properties within that. But, uh, with mums, ideally fresh colostrum uh, directly on the oral mucosa, uh, 0.2 mils. Uh, you can put it on syringe, in a syringe, you can put it on a swab. There have been studies that have shown uh, higher amounts of, uh, I think, IgA and lactoferrin in the urine of patients who got it on through the swab, uh, syringe versus the swab. Um, same dose, but um, obviously some of the absorbed residually in the swab. Um, but uh, it has been shown to um, improve the immune response in the patient. Um, possible protection against sepsis, neck, uh, VAPs, um, other infections. Um, even with the possibility of these things, at the very least, what it's doing, it's we're getting mom's milk and we're encouraging her to pump by getting some more milk. So even if they're not doing anything right now, uh, we're still getting mom's milk to use hopefully down with getting that ball rolling with the, the milk expression. 
Now, as soon as we're ready, uh, start minimal enteral feeds. Uh, minimal enteral feeds is defined as anything from 12 to 24 mils per kilo per day. Uh, our protocol for this population is one mil per kilo Q2. Sometimes we do minimal enteral feeds for larger patients. If they feed Q3, we typically do one mil per kilo Q3. Uh, it's just a small trophic, non nutritive type feeding, just to prime the gut. Um, it says there are RL6, uh, if not started within the first six hours of life, there is within reason. Uh, if the patient's stable, we don't need them for six hours. We're kind of told to start a file in RL6 just to reduce what's hit. Why would you want to do the baby? Um, in fact, this also goes for all patients, uh, even your healthy 37 weeker, relatively healthy 37 weeker. Um, first choice is obviously lumped milk. Uh, Many, 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 many things in there. You just cannot duplicate. You cannot put in formula. Uh, some of these things aren't available in uh, either, either donor breast milk, donor breast milk either, just because of the pasteurization process and the freezing. Um, there are very few contraindications, uh, but some of the more common ones are if mom's HIV positive, undergoing cancer treatment, uh, HSV with lesions, uh, active tuberculosis, case group based strep or here to the control of virus training one. Um, also a few contraindications with potential medications, but we usually leave this up to you guys to screen whether it's in the best interest of the patient or not to receive mum's milk. Um, if, we can, if we do not have mum's breast milk available, then the next choice would be the donor milk. Now, this is just a slide, a lot of numbers on here, but um, just outlining from more of a non-nutritional perspective, more of a new perspective, that mother's milk is not the same as donor milk. Um, the two types, there are two types of pasteurization, older pasteurization, the high temperature pasteurization. The milk banks, the Humana certified milk banks undergoes older pasteurization. Um, so this just shows roughly the uh, decrease in certain immune properties in uh, donor milk after pasteurization. Uh, so donor milk in general is usually a little bit lower in uh, nutritional content to specifically protein being, uh, and calories uh, from more being more turn milk. Um, also some electrolyte uh, uh, losses. And uh, other thing that might nutri affect nutrition is light based content. Light -based, uh, inherent light base in breast milk is also removed from uh, the pasteurization process. But just to show it's it's still better than formula because you can't put any of these things in formula, at least not yet. Uh, you know, the technology, companies don't have technology to do that, but um, the breast milk is still, mom's breast, breast, breast milk is still best. And just like mom's milk, donor milk does have a large spectrum of what's in there. Uh, average protein content is about uh, one gram per deciliter, one gram per hundred milliliters, even uh, calorie content. Uh, is still about 0.67 calories per milliliter. Um, and again, highly variable uh, from sample to sample. For mom's fresh milk, we would probably expect these graphs to be shifted to the right a little bit. Now, once starting TPN, uh, first thing that I always do is consider IP access, um, ruffle versus central lines. Uh, Peripheral, sure, for short term use, um, we can get by with them, especially. But my problem uh, and our, diet, our problem as dietitians is when we start running into food restrictions. Um, it can be difficult to meet energy uh, requirements with the osmolarity restrictions. Usually, these solutions have to be less than 900 milliosmoles. Uh, each site may be a little bit, have some variation in this number, but we typically follow this, um, which this usually restricts us to up to 3% amino acid uh, concentrations and 12 and a half percent dextrose concentrations. Uh, once we start adding electrolytes and things to this, it will uh, significantly increase that number. Um, so once we start working up on feeds or if we're restricted for any restricted with foods for any reason, we're not going to be getting adequate nutrition to these patients. Which is why if we have a patient on some for long term, we're always going to advocate, can we get a central line? Um, this way, it's much easier to meet 100% of their, their nutritional requirements. We can fit much, much more up to 5% amino acid uh, and greater than 20% uh, dextrose concentrations. 
So if you're going to be writing a TPN script for someone who's NPO or not NPO, the first thing we always want to try to consider is what are their total energy requirements? Because under your energy requirements, you have your three macronutrients that make up your total energy activity, fat, protein, and carbs. So first thing we, we do as dietitians, we consider what is the total, uh, what is our expected energy uh, requirements of this particular patient? Uh, so we consider basal metabolic rate, activity, growth, uh, diet-induced genesis. These babies aren't feeding significantly much, so not much of an issue, at least not yet. Uh, any corrected, a correction of any pre-existing malnutrition will be babies at baseline are to some degree malnourished, uh, or at least at high nutritional risk, uh, or high risk of becoming malnourished. What we try to do with this number is, under, through it, is provide a proper balance of lipids, amino acids, and dextrose. So the recommendation on the first day of life is provide at least 45 to 55 calories per kilogram per day. Um, once we've established a few days of baby stabilized, we can actually get them to start growing, assuming they're going to be on TPN for a long period of time. This number increases to about 90 to about 120 calories per kilogram. Very difficult to get sit at 120 per kilo number safely without really putting a lot of stress on the liver and uh, the body, but Especially these tiny ones. Especially these tiny ones. 700 grams a little. But one of the key things here is also consider other sources of nutrition. So as we start to increase our feeds uh, enterally, uh, we're also decreasing the IV, increase EN as PM decreases, uh, or vice versa. Uh, but we're also compensating for what we're feeding enterally when we're writing the TPM. So there are a few lipid emulsions that we have seen over the years. Uh, but lipids, IV lipids are a dead source of energy, 10 calories per gram, uh, compared to 9 calories per gram enterally. Uh, not all emulsions are created equally. Um, the soybean emulsion, aka intralipid, which we used to use years ago, I think we still have it available. Uh, it's 100% soybean, soybean oil. Uh, it's more of a pro-inflammatory lipid profile, so these patients in the past have been uh, known to develop cholestasis over time. Uh, it's not reckoned for use more, it says more than a few days here, but I think the suggestion now is more than two weeks. Um, the other end of this, the inflammatory spectrum is fish oil. This is your omega man. Uh, it is 100% fish oil. It is less pro-inflammatory, but um, the, because there is such a high concentration of um, the fish oil in there, the maximum dose that we can give is one gram per kilo per day. Um, because it's only fish oil, there aren't any other oils in there, you are at risk of developing, developing a, potentially developing a such a fatty acid deficiency over time. Um, and this is usually for prolonged use. Uh, Keynote, it has not been proven to prevent cholestasis, um, but the usage has demonstrated quicker reversal, whether it's just eating less parenterally or the, also the lipid emulsion also has some uh, anti-inflammatory benefits. There are other emulsions available. The third one that we use here is our multi-component or our SMOF oil. Uh, this is soy, medium chain triglycerides, all in that fish oil. Um, it is not a 20% emulsion, it is actually 10%. Um, so it will require more volume to administer. Um, it is a very close omega-6 to omega-3 uh, fatty acid ratio to breast milk. You need at least two grams per kilo per day to prevent such a fatty acid. Most of our patients on this for a long period of time are getting at least two grams per kilo. Um, patients are still prone to developing cholestasis with this, as we have seen, uh, but it is a less pro-inflammatory uh, fatty acid profile compared to the intralipid, but uh, sorry, a yeah, less, a less inflammatory than intra, but more than omega band. So the recommendations for lipids on day one of life, um, we're going within the first 48 hours, is start at least one to two grams per kilo. We typically start with one gram per kilo per day. Um, increase by about one gram per kilo per day. Two, our goal is usually about three, but it is safe to go up to four grams per kilo. We've never had to do that. Um, but it is an option if we really need to, um, but at which point we should be paying close attention to the triglycerides and the function. Um, lipid intake should also make up about 25 to 50% of the non-protein calories within that TPA. Amino acids provide roughly four calories per gram. Um, again, this is started as soon as you 
start the uh, start solution, but uh, as soon as you possibly can to avoid uh, accumulating your negative nitrogen balance. Um, and utilization depends on a lot of factors, uh, but more so just general other energy intake, usually about 30 to 40 grams per one gram of uh, amino acid uh, in order to begin to um, build some lean tissue. Um, it is important also don't dose, don't give more amino acids to give more calories, only give amino acids to meet your protein requirements. Um, but once we do, once you are calculating your energy intake, the protein is considered part of your total energy intake. Uh, but don't give, don't just give more protein to give more calories. Um, and it's also in, in, relatively inconclusive in some of the studies whether a high amino acid intake results in a higher PUN, especially within the first few, few days of life. Uh, a lot of other factors there. Um, but later on, there is more of a, a correlation to moderate protein intake with um, serum US. So the recommended intake for the first day of life uh, on that first trip that you'll rate to start with the amino acid intake of 1.5 to 2.5 grams per kilo per day. Um, and then increase anywhere from about 1.5 to 1 gram per kilo per day thereafter as tolerated. Um, but the jury is kind of about whether or not we should be going above 3.5 grams per kilo per day. It depends which reference ranges you're looking at. The European ranges suggest not to go above 3.5, just citing that there is no benefit in long-term neurological outcomes if you go to four grams per kilo per day. The American Society, although their guidelines are a little bit older, uh, say you can go up to four grams per kilo per day. Um, typically, I don't go above 3.5 grams per kilo, but if you do have that very sick 26, 27 week event, I think you can go to four grams per kilo per day on occasion. Especially like some of those really long term, like maybe you can have to like reduce the the fatigue provision. Um, then you maybe need to go up on a new acid. Maybe have like an open wound maybe to compensate for that healing process. So it's very from protein loss. Individualized, yeah, protein losses. Like, are you having like yeah, where could you be losing protein from? So. Try to get definitely get to 3.5, but then certain babies you go to four. Uh, another thing that we get asked sometimes is, well, what about the the albumin slow? Can we go up on the protein? Yeah, what do you think of that in the long term TPM? So, Jeremy, what is our maximum uh, protein for this tiny macupremi usually? You guys do. This patient uh, is relatively stable, just for the sake of simplicity for today's presentation. But uh, for her, I wouldn't go above three point five grams per kilo per day. Okay. So you are not considering uh, urea as a kind of given the impaired renal function within the first few days of life. I'm after, but after. Uh, after. I do look at it, but I also consider what else is going on clinically before making a decision. Okay. If there's any signs of any renal impairment, then I wouldn't worry too too much about it. Some protocols they will check the uh, the levels and then yeah. I also consider how much protein I'm giving. If I'm only giving two grams per kilo per day and the patient's two weeks old mm -hmm. and the BUN is seventeen, then like this doesn't make sense. Yeah. This protein issue is so confusing, like, uh, and it is a kind of time crashing. Sometimes uh, the waves coming are increasing to the four four point five, yeah. and then they, they say, no, 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 just don't go if they beyond the two or two point five. Okay. Yeah, but it, it, it's it's interesting because the, there was an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, a few months ago. Uh, and there was a study done out of New Zealand and Australia talking about refeeding syndrome and protein administration. Uh, I think the takeaway of it is make sure you're providing a balanced script and don't be too, too aggressive because some of your gluconeogenic amino acids may contribute to refeeding syndrome. Yeah. Um, more so, I think, is your dextrose, but make sure you're providing a balanced script too. Yeah. Um, I don't want to distract the topic, but uh, because you mentioned about the refeeding syndrome, there was another uh, very, very interesting article about the refeeding syndrome and the late onset sepsis. Because 
the uh, it was determined in the animal studies in New England and very high uh, rank journal published 20 years ago. They did a low phosphate level yeah. and the relation with the, within the, the babies, like a, uh, the animal's immune system or something like that. The phosphate is necessary for ATPA and then it is necessary for the uh, yeah. fighting with the bacteria. Yeah. So, and then 20 years after this uh, animal study, they determined there is a relation between the uh, feeding syndrome and the rate of increasing. They, they, would, they kind of looked at the same outcomes, uh, similar outcomes in this study, uh, or at least one of them. There was, uh, there was the analysis and the sub-analysis, um, but they looked at, I want to say, IVH, ROP, just general outcomes, those with uh, prolonged hypophosphatemia within the first few days of life, um, and poorer outcomes. Yeah. It was uh, interesting, but that's why I mean, probably you shouldn't push the baby too much in the first couple of days. Don't be, don't be too afraid of possible either. <laughs> so, what's, what's your verdict on the album? And if your liver, if your oh. liver is okay and you're not overloaded with food, albumin's a negative acute based reactor. So, if there's any stress, the album is going to go down. I don't honestly, I don't look too closely at the album in the first week of life, two weeks of life, uh, because it's usually. 20 to 15, um, and it'll go over time soon. The baby's stable at the end of their nutritional requirements. And the half life valve is what, 30 days? So, by giving a little more protein, assuming we're already meeting our needs, it's not going to increase our food base 24 hours or 48 hours. But the question is if it's persistently low beyond the two weeks, three weeks, I think it may give an expression that this baby is in negative balance and may require higher requirement. Uh, Potentially, yeah, yeah, potentially, yeah. So that's well, yeah, at the same point. We're always we're also monitoring growth too. You, you should be able to see some sort of growth, and if the baby's growing and, and what we're providing them nutritionally looks adequate. The drawback is that hypoalbuminemia will give edema, will give false weight. Yeah. So <laughs> also, this special also, cycle would not, will never be broken until it's you. important to look at the patient clinically. Too. Yeah. Um, so dextrose. Um, the 3.4 calories per gram compared to enteral carbohydrate, which is 4 calories per gram, should make about 40 to 60% of total energy intake. This is what you want to adjust for to provide energy. Um, you're dosing your amino acids for protein. Uh, that you're kind of restricted to 3 grams per kilo per day, but your dextrose is really what you can tweak. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem here is we always run into issues with hypoglycemia, especially in the first few days of life. So keep a close eye on your glucose infusion rate. Uh, prevent overfeeding, underfeeding, um, along with any other micronutrients that you may need to support this. So your phosphate. Um, maximum glucose diffusion rates in TPN uh, should be 12 milligrams per kilogram per minute. This is equivalent to about 17 and a half grams per kilo per day of dextrose. Um, if we do obviously have hyperglycemia, uh, blood sugar is greater than 10. Uh, we should we should be treated with insulin, but what's suggested in the literature is bring it down to a manageable glucose infusion rate first, which is usually somewhere without compromising nutrition around six to eight milligrams per kilogram per minute. Um, so just to watch out there. Um, so day one, um, start anywhere through about. 40 milligrams per kilogram per minute of dextrose. Um, this is anywhere from about six to 12 grams per kilo per day. Uh, our strips usually start off with six to eight, is I think what we usually do, and then increase by about uh, one to two milligrams per kilogram per minute per day. Uh, we'll go very, very slow for these patients because they usually have sugars in the, the 12s. But uh, keep a close eye on blood sugars be our dose to begin the uh, dextrose appropriately. But our goal is um, usually between eight to 10. Uh, I think we go a little bit higher rather than 14.4 grams per kilo, we go up to 16. Uh, sometimes a little bit lower for the term kids or those with uh, chronic liver issues. Um, but typically no lower than four milligrams per kilo, no higher than 12. Um, electrolytes. Um, early sodium restriction has shown positive benefits in the long run. Um, 
but really the only sodium that you should be giving is what's inherent in the art line. Plus, you may need a little bit of either sodium or potassium in the TPN just to get a little bit of the phosphate. We need something to bind the phosphate, sodium phosphate, potassium phosphate. Um, but the other thing, if you do want some potassium in there, keep again keep an eye on the eating syndrome. Uh, there's also non-allergic hypokalemia. Um, recommendations anywhere from zero to three millimoles for the first few days of life. And then once the patient stabilizes a little bit, anywhere from about two to seven millimoles per kilo of sodium. We do have losses in the urine along with uh, two to three millimoles per kilo of uh, potassium. Electrolytes, calcium fetal accretion rate is about 3.4 millimoles per kilo per day, uh, which is quite high. Typically, we have difficulty giving this much calcium. We're lucky, I think, for patients to tolerate it to get from one to one, one to one point five millimoles per kilo in the TPM. Um, possibly, it kind of goes hand in hand to uh, fetal accretion rates about two point six millimoles per kilo per day. You also need about one gram of protein accretion. Uh, sorry, one gram of protein accretion needs a little bit of phosphate. Try to provide a molar ratio of calcium phosphorus of one point three to one or about one point one to one. Uh, this is honestly usually a little bit closer to 0 0.8 to 1 within the first few days of life, just with the inherent higher phosphate needs. Um, so your repeating syndrome ATP uh, support. Magnesium as well. Uh, also consider uh, if mom got uh, max here. So just general requirements, calcium 0.8 to 2 millimoles per kilo. We start somewhere 0.5 to 0.8. Uh, I like to try to push it up to 0.8 for the first day, especially for these small babies. Uh, phosphorus 1 to mag 0.1 to 0.2 millimoles per kilo per day. So what does this look like after it's all said and done? Um, TFI is 80 mils per kilo. You're accounting for your art line and this plus other infusions, but we do have a good central line in the uh, UVC. Um, dextrose will start with eight grams per kilo per day, which is, which is a glucose infusion rate of five milligrams per kilogram per uh, minute. Got that wrong. Uh, uh, keep a close eye on blood sugars. Um, amino acids will start with two grams per kilo, go up by about 0.5 to one gram per kilo per day. Um, so this gives a total energy intake of about 45 calories per kilo, which means our minimum energy requirements. Uh, a little bit of electrolytes, uh, whatever. Fit in a little bit of calcium and phosphorus, and then we'll be doing our blood work the following morning. So, we do, I think we all know this sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, uh, check the kidney function, acid base status, tricks, uh, albumin as well. Um, blood sugar should be done at least once a day, more often than not, more frequently for these patients. But even for the patient on long term TPN, uh, blood sugar should be checked at least once a day. Um, liver function tests um, at least once weekly. Um, but it should be done in the, one of the first panels uh, for these patients. Uh, CBCs, I think they're done anyways for these, this population, but should be done. Um, and there's also more long-term monitoring where we'll pay, pay closer uh, attention to bone mineralization, vitamin D, uh, INR, trace elements, so specifically selenium, zinc, copper, manganese, uh, even aluminum sometimes, which can be a contaminant to TDM. And when the patients are on, like, going to be on TPN for more than a month, we do bring them up at TPN rounds, for which you guys are always welcome to come. I think maybe you, you came to one a while back. <laughs> um, but there is a TPN rounds, and we do it every Tuesday at one o'clock. So any of the long term babies, then we'll talk with the GI there. Um, there's a our, um, the pharmacist, or sorry, the, the dietitian from PICU, and then also a surgeon. Yeah, uh, it's on Teams. You just come to our office at one o'clock. <laughs> but it's any of those long term ones. Just one question about this uh, dextrose thing content, especially if we encounter hyperglycemia on the maybe by the end of the first week. How low can we go on glucose infusion rate like GIR? Well, according to the guidelines, don't go lower than four. As dietitians, we're going to tell you not to go lower than six, six to eight because yeah. then we're really compromising nutrition. Uh, when you're actually calculating the glucose infusion rate for TPN, always look at the rate that the infusion is running at and compare that to the rate that's ordered because 
as you're working up on your feeds, um, the nurses are titrating down on their infusion, right? So the rate that's ordered may not be the rate that's actually you're using at the bedside. And so to calculate the actual glucose and that's what I do every other we do every single morning as we're looking at the right that side to that side. We look and see what everything's running at just to compare if that's what we're actually giving. Uh, make sure you keep keep an eye on that too. Okay, so then if this happens, should you adjust your protein and repeat the according to glucose intake? Because it, uh, it depends how little we're providing. If we're only giving a glucose infusion rate of maybe four, then I probably would scale back up my amino acids a little bit, mm -hmm. just because the, those amino acids at that point they wouldn't be used per se for uh, growth for growth for true for true growth. It might go more towards energy use, yeah. just because you don't have the substrate to really put towards growth, unless you're of course giving a little bit more. Stuff. How much? Sorry, sorry, we could interrupt. No, this is Great. good. That's right. So, for hyperglycemia, how much would your lipids be causing insulin resistance? Like, at what point would you start considering that your GIR is low, you can't go below lower than six, you're on lipids? Would you rather just start insulin as opposed to maybe come back a bit on your? But I think we'll back to cutting back on lipids anyways, just to provide more mm -hmm. of a somewhat balanced script. I, again, I don't want to comp you don't want to compromise nutrition too much. Yeah, sure. uh, but at some point, I think if you're if you're only giving a glucose infusion rate of four or five, there's the fucking sugar is about the 10s, you're gonna have stars. I think it depends, like again, it depends on the baby and the situation, but we want to try to keep nourishing patients. So Absolutely. I personally would use I'll usually aspirin. When can we start insulin? Like we're this is how low we're getting. Still having highs, are are we com are you comfortable with with insulin? Yet? But you're you're always comfortable with higher sugars than lower sugars. You don't That's want those really high And talking about sugar, for those who are in the room, because it's dietitian day in the kitchen, uh, we brought some mega candy. So help yourself. You need a little boost as we're about midway through the presentation now. <laughs> it has super effect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of uh, candy my kid got for Valentine's Day was unreal this year. So, <laughs> um, okay, so now we're that's like kind of like all the TPN kind of getting started. Now we're back to baby Carly. Uh, for those who joined in late, this is a uh, 27, 26 week baby, so it's 700 grams. Yeah, um, so we're now can I take this off? Well, mm. um. So now we're six days old. Um, you're on your full goal TPN, hopefully, and your TFI is 150. We've been giving MEF of uh, mother's milk. So we always want to think of her supply. Like maybe mom has ample amount to providing the MEF, but we're only giving like 12 mils for the whole day. Um, we want to keep going on with our OIT and um, using that with milk care. We know this baby Carly is passing stools. So that is something that we look at too, is how much stooling are they doing? Um, daughter pools, uh, SMOF three, three and a half and 16. So do you know what our overall calories that we're giving her is? How much calories are you giving? Mm -hmm. What's our cows per kilo right now? Oh, he's got a cal his calculator. It's perfect. <laughs> Is this your payback for all the Or we have our Excel spreadsheet that is so 16 times 3.4, 3 and a half times 4, 94 plus 14, 108. 98. 98, why? 16 times 4, 3.4. 3.4? Yeah, because it's... Uh, interval? Or, it's not interval. It's IV, which means four. That's what you said. Four, four is central. Four is central. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's true. So that's yeah. your little kids. Yeah. 16 times 3.4, three and a half times your four, and then 
get it. So yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so your blood glucose we checked is good, 4.6. The baby has a small PDA, little Carly, um, but her respiratory status is stable. He got my dynamic is stable. So what now? Protocol feed. Hey, <laughs> protocol feeds. She's mm -hmm. pooping. She is uh, at her goal TPN. So she, everything, blood sugar looks good. So we're going to start her protocol feeds. But before we start protocol feeds, I have in brackets there, consider mom's and cook bio. I'm going to take a minute here because I feel like um, our milk, the amount of breast milk that our babies are getting is quite low. Um, so we want to focus. I know we were asked to talk about TPN, but I think it's also important to talk about once we have uh, going to be starting. So just a few slides here on optimizing mother's milk. Um, so we want to do early expression. Uh, so that is, if our goal is to feed the baby within six hours of life, then that mom should be hand expressing or trying to get some kind of milk within six hours of life. And that's where we're using our colostrum collection kits to help uh, make that happen. Uh, so hand expression, frequent expression. So eight times in a 24 hour period is our goal. So that can be for the mom anywhere from two to every two to four hours. Some moms prefer to do it two hours during the day and uh, every four hours at night. So trying to get that eight times in a day. Um, getting the double electric breast pump. You guys know where the prescriptions are and how to fill that out, where to get the pump. We don't fill it. Or you don't fill it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Right. That's it. Pending fill it. But you can get it. Have it. Have 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 um, and then on our colostrum collection kit there, there is a description on how to hand express to do that um, massaging. And then the biggest thing that helps to bring mom's milk in is contact with her baby, right? So doing that skin to skin contact before she's expressing and having it done every day. Now we also wanna talk a bit about kangaroo care. I think that we're doing good. But then when I'm in the room talking to families, they ask me, can I do kangaroo care? Can I hold my baby? I've actually been really surprised since Christmas how many um, families have asked, oh, am I allowed to breastfeed now? <laughs> so um, I think it's just important to have that discussions. And I know for the families who are in rounds, we get to talk about that. Um, but those families that aren't there during rounds don't get to see us. If you have like a um, second to just talk about that breastfeeding plan, talk about what's the kangaroo care plan for the day, um, it goes a really long way with the families and for our babies. So just some key highlights of kangaroo care. It helps our physiologic stability, uh, improve gas exchange, improve heart rate, uh, reduce apnea, better thermal regulation. Uh, and why is a dietitian talking about kangaroo care? Why do we care? We're dietitians. Why do we care about kangaroo care? Yeah, just run. The <laughs> Because nobody else is talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. <laughs> Means you're reducing energy energy. expenditure. The baby reduces energy expenditure when they're yeah. in kangaroo care for at least more than two hours. There's a couple studies. There's a, one I put pop, popped up there. Actually, see, I forgot to put it here, but it was in the NICU and, and benefits of kangaroo care. Um, the big one for me is that improved peristalsis and improved waking. Because you're getting a better sleep on the mom than you are an incubator, especially babies that are like ventilated or in a noisier environment. If you're on the, your parent, you're going to have better sleep, better growth. So that, that's why it's important for us. Like every, everything on that list that will affect the and right? Yeah, because if all of this is in better uh, control, mm -hmm. then you're less stress on the baby, better growth. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also for the mom, increasing her, her uh, attachments and the production. All right, so now protocol feeds. <laughs> um, so our standardized uh, protocol feeds are 20, based on 25 to 30 mils per kilogram per day. 
So if you, for this baby part, because she's 700 grams, we have standardized food protocol that we just tick on our order sheet. Um, but if you do have those bigger babies and you're making up a feeding advancement, just try to remember that we never want to go more than 30 mils per kilo per day. So say if you're starting at 5 mLs, increasing 5 mLs per feed on a 2.6 kilogram baby, that's going to be quite a bit higher, right, than 30 mils per kilo. So maybe that size of baby, we should start at three and go up three every other. If you're writing a feeding order for the first day of life for a baby that's just admitted and you're going to be at full feeds in the first 24 hours, that's too fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Just the, the first feed the baby's going to take by breast is going to be a half teaspoon to a teaspoon of water. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so with feeding protocols, the neat thing about it in some of the studies is whether you, whatever your feeding protocol is, that doesn't matter. What matters is that you have a protocol and you stick to it, which we do. <laughs> so, so we stick to it. Um, but that's that's highlighted anywhere, no matter if you're going a slow feeding protocol or a faster feeding protocol. If your institution has a protocol, it will reduce kind of these starting and stoppings and like delaying to getting to full feeds. Um, and then just remember when you are writing your TPN that. Once we're on protocol, this is now where we're making those adjustments. So we're at our goal TPN, but we're going to start to slowly decrease it as we're going up on entry because we don't want to over, over finish the baby. So then once we're getting to our, we always say we're at half feeds, we can start HMF and stop lipids. Just remember that it's the 70 to 80 mils per kilo per day. Is that where we're at naturally? So here's our feeding protocol. Um, so we've got our five for this 700 grammar. We got our five days of MEF. Um, and then we're starting to increase. This one looks like half a mil every third feed, which would be every six hours. We're up. Um, now on the on the bottom, have a little hint there as for meeting our, our nutrient requirements and what we're gonna do. So we start fortifying our donor milk, our mother's milk, um, but this baby is gonna be getting a unique fortifier. So when we're starting this protocol, this is what we're looking at for now our parenteral, or sorry, our enteral. Jeremy talked about the parenteral. So now here's our, our enteral goals. Um, it's still, no matter kind of what size the baby is, your overall calories is still gonna be about 110 to 135 per kilo per day. Um, but then it's that protein, right? And then when you're feeding enterally, you can give that higher protein. So that's, you know, in your TPN, you're gonna stick to three and a half generally, maybe certain patients up to four. But now once you're feeding the gut, you're gonna be giving higher amounts of protein. So these are, we kind of have these goals in mind as we're working up on feeds with a target. And then we're kind of planning ahead, okay, we have to add this, we have to add this. Like we have a plan going forward of how we're gonna meet these things off the top. And again, it's that we were talking about earlier, if we're writing a TPN now, it's not starting till 1800. And then once that gets hung, that baby's not gonna see 100% of that bag. So sometimes we might overshoot just a little bit, knowing that as the day is going on, they're seeing less and less of that. Um, so it, sometimes we still get the question, like why are we fortifying? So this slide would show that if we give Unfortified mother's milk at 150 mils per kilo per day. How much protein? So 1.8 calories, 100 calcium, sodium, iron. Um, whereas now we're going to add in a human milk fortifier and we're going to concentrate it to about 0.8 cal per kilo. So 150 uh, is our TFI still. Um, but look at that protein. So what is our human milk fortifier doing? Yeah, protein, vitamins, and minerals. Yeah, we're not really increasing our carbohydrates at all. 
uh, our fat amount stays pretty much the same. We didn't really put it on here, but that protein, um, and then look, the calcium, 0.9 to 4.3, sodium, um, our iron is adding in as well. So that's that's our biggest thing. When I explain to the parents, I usually say we're doing it for the bones and the brain. Those are the biggest things. We're adding in our protein and our vitamins and minerals. Well, I call it protein, vitamin, and mineral supplement to parents. Yeah. Well, there are some like different approach, um, especially like because we are close to Europe. Uh, the UK studies are affecting us a little bit uh, significantly, and the doctor Nina Modi, one of the opposite uh, leader of this nutrition. So she always like a faster uh, increase the everything like um, thirty or I don't know more than twenty ml per kilo per day, and then she is. Big support to increase to 180 to 200, with like a not too much fortification, but the increase uh, instead of that, that volume. Uh, so, what, what do you think about this policy? Or like, what is the benefit and the and the harm compared to because we are adding too much? Sometimes, even I'm thinking, oh, it's too much. How baby can tolerate this uh, kind of too much additives, uh, like. Uh, Proteins and then that's, that's kind of why I like to, if I can, go up on the TFI to 165 because that way we're really optimizing. We're optimizing everything, but we're minimizing how much we have to fortify. But the flip side to that is just potential harm the volume, well, the volume they provide, whether it's more reflux or after operation or. I mean, like, a, like you're thinking about you are giving less uh, concentrated uh, volume, on, like a, a amount, like less concentrated uh, milk, then your transition time will be faster than like a com in, concentrated in theory. In theory. Yeah. But, I, but I think as long as they are to some degree are fortifying a little bit to meet your requirements. And there's more than one ways to do it. I mean, she and we was, were talking about that when we were getting the presentation she's, ready. She's not talking like a, you know, she's talking based on the, her research. Not she's talking about I'm expertise. Uh, yeah. uh, she's, she's showing like a lot of research about this one. It shows like a high volume and a little less uh, mm -hmm. concentrated one is absorbed uh, and then um, tolerated better. Actually. This one, like they're thinking. And the other thing is the how do you prove the, your your Rena solid load is if this kind of concentration is enough, like uh, you know, clean and everybody. Can you get to my point? Because yeah. you are giving less less volume of water, so much protein and the other things, and then it is increasing your Rena solid load. But all our babies have high hyponatremia by the 31, 32 weeks. So if you look at that, they, they need more salt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, this is an exception. And I think, like, I, I'm thinking long term too. Like, what are those bones looking like long term? Because we see those babies, well, and maybe I see babies who have had lots of feeding intolerances, and maybe we haven't been able to fortify them. But later on, like, their process and like their their bone profile, they don't look good. Like they, they look pretty poor. Is it? But it is it because that baby was sick, or is it because we had nourished them? I don't know. But there are yeah. studies going back. Of when did the human fortifier start? The eighties. Eighties, nine. I might that might be too long ago. I'm not too sure. But there's tons of evidence supporting these kind of or I guess the guidelines in the previous slide, along with calcium bond and everything. Uh, just for bone mineralization, neurodevelopment, uh, cognitive abilities later in life uh, with fortification, even post discharge for that matter. So, it, I'm not saying a fortifier is absolutely necessary, depending on what fluid or like, because we, we can do two things we can either give more volume or fortify more. It's a meet our nutritional requirements. I know, like, those babies are uh, having too much of them, and sometimes, um, yeah, like, this is another problem, but that's. Her opinion, and uh, he, she always talking in every meeting uh, in, in Europe, uh, showing her, her like ideas. And anyway, um, well, 
majority of our babies, like the preterms, like majority of them can even they are no, most of them are following intolerance most of the time when you go use higher. The bump. Use the about, bump. even with the bump, some of them they have yeah. 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 So even yeah. some sugar babies with high volume of 180, they can tolerate like just vomiting anything yeah. they to. But I also wonder like are there other things that they're doing? Like are they doing full on like living on the families? Like right, are they not in an incubator all the time? Are they like lots of there's lots of reports too of them like their kangaroo care rate is way higher than ours. The way that they overall treat the baby is different. So maybe it's just a completely different approach to how they care for their patients too. But it is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then this kind of goes into those factors <laughs> that maybe plays into it too, is just all those other factors that are um, affecting human milk composition, like how there's diet. Is a Mediterranean diet making an influence on it? Maybe, possibly. Um, so this is just a really uh, neat slide. Uh, I actually brought the article too, and it's um, referenced at the bottom here. Um, just showing all of the different factors that affect the composition of a month specific mother's milk. Um, so the maternal factors and then even infant factors to even the type of um, male or female um, and how that milk composition is created, uh, the amount of milk that a mom can make. Um, like we have some moms who are trying, seem like they're trying so hard to get their milk supply up and they are just struggling and struggling and struggling. So is it stress, is it their diet, is it like the environment that they're in here? Um, and then how does that all play into the nutrient composition and the bioactivity of, of mother cell? Um, and then again, the listing of ev everything, uh, immunoglobulins, uh, to cytokines that mother's milk provides, that formula just can't. And like Jeremy showed that the donor milk has less of. And lots of research right now going on about polyunsaturides. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right, so now we're on our protocol feeds of mother's milk. We brought up mom's milk, and we're going to start to fortify. So, baby Carly is 700 grams. So, our current criteria is that all babies less than 27 weeks uh, and a birth weight less than 750 grams we we'll are be starting the prolacta. So this is our human milk, human milk fortifier. Um, it's added to mother's milk or donor milk. We will usually start out of what we call a prolact plus six. So because it's American, the plus six refers to six calories per ounce. Um, so it brings it up to a 0.9. We don't even use a 0.8 anymore um, because we find that it the babies just don't. <laughs> they still grow. They don't. They don't respond as the same to it. Um, first, in, first requirements are also inadequate. Yeah, not enough. First intake. First intake is that. Yeah, when we first started using prolacta, it was new to us, so we we always did a plus four, plus six. We don't even use plus four anymore. And the centers across Canada and the states that are using it, apparently, they don't even use plus four either. Um, they just go up to plus six. What is important to know is that we are displacing a lot of mother's milk. Um, so it would be um, for a hundred mil feed, uh, 40 mil, 40, 30. Which one? Plus 30. 30, 30, yeah, plus, plus eight. So 30 mils of that hundred is the prolacta. So it displaces quite a bit. Um, for some moms, this is great because moms who don't have a full milk supply, uh, it'll make it look like it's a full milk supply where it's not. Um, however, for others, we're not using as much of mom's milk and we're using quite a bit more of the prolacta. Um, but the biggest benefit that we saw um, was the, the tolerance of feeds, um, less stop times due to feeding intolerance. Um, we were able to get the babies off of TPN faster because you're basically you're nourishing them faster uh, and they're getting to their full feeds faster so you can stop that line and that line faster. So we are not giving product uh, if they be more than 750 grams like this. It's not an automatic. So if they're born over 27 weeks or over 750 grams, then we would use our bovine HMF. 
but if they had intolerances or like GI concerns, that we would stop that bovine HMF. Okay. And then we have to prove that it really was that, it wasn't something else. So we have to try to do it again. Um, and if that intolerance happens again, uh, then we would stop it and then we would start the product. I think if they're twins, then the smaller one would apply to both, right? Because whatever applies to the smaller one, they're twins. That's with, that's with donors. Well, only with donor milk, not the prolacta. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, if one, if the baby we're talking about was 26 weeks, but weighed 800 grams, they would still fall back. Yeah. So it's one or the other. Then they would continue on until their 32 weeks or two kilos, whichever comes first. Usually it's the 32 weeks is what comes first. Um, then do you use like one episode of intolerance for less than 27 weeks? Then? No, zero. We zero. Zero. Oh, yeah. sorry. And this is newer. Um, before it was, yeah. they had to have one episode. Now it's don't even. We oh, okay. just started. Oh, okay. And the reason, the biggest reason we changed that is because we found that, oh, I did the numbers. It was around 70% of our babies needed the prolacta mm -hmm. due to intolerance. So instead of making them all fail, we just got showed our our reasoning and, and now we have that no no episodes in there yeah. the um uh, the multiple failures with the second criteria it, it's difficult because there was the charlotte and uh the carrie bonner uh ethel already to publish a I think it was a case report um five six years ago um, yeah, I was on that. just uh, outlining the failure method that we did follow but one of the statements in there and it still does hold true is is these the tolerance over time does it is is it a function of time or is it actually the fortifier that really resolves the issue because these babies usually are quite unstable for the first yeah. well after the honeymoon period is over and obviously there will be some feeding intolerance there. And I do notice we get more reflux feeding intolerance when babies start getting up to 100 pounds per kilo. Um, but will that resolve over time and babies will tolerate a bovine fortifier? Or but the benefit of the product is Charlotte said is just we do notice anecdotally better tolerance. And we are able to feed these kids and keep their minds out. Okay, so. For baby Carly, this is what she would get. Um, if the baby was bigger, so say that over 750 grams or over 27 weeks, then we would use our bovine fortifier. Um, so it's back to that table I showed earlier. It's going, it's reflected on that is the uh, the higher protein. Your protein is uh, milk protein ice, isolate and the whey is high, like a hydrolysate. So it's not a hydrolyzed protein, but it's a, like partially broken down whey. Um, then the carbohydrate is a small amount of corn syrup and lactose and the fat is soy and there's an MCT component to it also so it's about 40% MCT oil in it um, regular formulas would be lower um, but the bovine fortifier has a little bit higher um, when we are starting it so we do in two stages and that's just for feeding tolerance uh, is we would start one package in 50, so that's your one in 50, start it at 75 mils per kilo enterly. Um, and then once you know, we get up to the one or 35 mils per kilo entry, then we can do our full HF by 25. All right, so now uh, Carly's been on that. She's off her TPN. It's day of like 12. And her weight is, so she was born at 700. Her current weight is 675. Her TFI is 150 mils per kilo. Um, IV's out. She's on the prolacta 0.6. So that's giving 0.9 cal per mil and 0.026 grams of protein per mil. Is that adequate? Is that adequate? Which one of those are the things? So she's getting enough calories and protein. Um, I see calculating. <laughs> it should be adequate. <laughs> you lost only 25 grams. But you still is also double over I mean, yeah, plus minus. Uh, there's nothing right. It's, it's getting three point nine. Yep. 
3.9 yeah, 3.9 grams of protein per kilo and calories is about like 130 ish. Yeah, yeah. Protein's yeah. actually the middle on the low end. Yeah, because her goal we'll give up for one half. be that. Oops, we circled the wrong one, sorry. Her goal would be the four to four and a half. Mm -hmm. so, she, so she'd be getting a little bit less. Um, so that could be optimized. Oh, um, but we check that her sodium is only 134. And she has some frequent reflux, according to the nurse. So this is what she looks like on her growth chart. Often for these little ones, we don't have a head circumference and a length, right? Because we're not touching them really in the first 72 hours. So now we have one. Um, the dots are a little bit big, sorry. But you can see she's kind of around like the 24th percentile. Uh, and now she's less than the 10th percentile. So she's lost a little bit. Um, are you worried that she's falling below the 10th percentile? Yeah, are you worried about that? Like this is um, this is basically on the intrauterine growth chart. So, but technically, when they were born, they usually they usually follow like this. It doesn't 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 show that one. Like, uh, but the the older ones are yeah. uh, showing like this. Kind of yeah, thing. this is this is the fenton curve. Yeah. Uh, so technically, she's been only on five days. Of the annual fees, full annual fees. Yeah. And I'm assuming even less on the uh, board of wires. Mm -hmm. So I think if she's adequately, if she has adequate calories on board, at least on like number wise, I think we can wait a bit more and see until her new eating regimen kicks in. Yeah. I think we just call on this the, for the, like fact, the, fact that she, the fact that she's below birthly here may even be a good sign that she's on the dry side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're not we're, we're giving good nutrition. A little bit of work to maybe get possibly, but I if that's I know some people get a little bit worried over their technically small manifestation rate because of below the 10% though right now, but this looks completely physiologic. And I think the more rapidly you try to correct the long-term um, like metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and you, you want proportion, you want proportional growth. The girl will talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, energy protein intake, so we, we got that, that she's getting good calories, but her protein could be optimized a little bit. She's getting about 3.9, goals four, four and a half. Now what about the reflux? Are you worried about that? We're feeding Q2, she's goalless. Oh. <laughs> yeah, like if, do we want to optimize that by giving her a little bit more calories? Um, or by volume, we went up on the prolacta. We're we're still going to be bump, bumping it up, but our the micronutrients are pretty much going to be the same because prolacta they just change the macronutrients and the micronutrients remain similar. Um, so if we want to go up on that TFI, might do like you said, go to on a pump for yeah. a little bit. We always try to keep it bolus as much as we can. I always try to avoid continuous, but maybe a little bit on a pump be okay. Um, but if we also think about what else can we do to increase growth. So we have invert syringe. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Doing that kangaroo care, making sure that's happening. Um, when reflex is happening, oh, are you doing kangaroo care? I try to ask that as much as I can. Um, and make sure that's happening and make sure that we're getting more mother's milk. So how much of this now is mother's milk? How much of it is now donor? Because if it's donor, then our protein amount is going to be even lower because it's about 0.3 millimoles less on average of protein. And the, the numbers we quoted in rounds with breast milk and donor milk, to be completely honest, they are just estimates. We have no clue. Because we don't have an analyzer, right? We just use based on the averages. Well, we tend to follow the lower end of what can be amongst folks. So uh, possibly more often than not, babies are getting a little bit more, but it's very reasonable to assume that they, maybe they might be getting a little bit less. Um, and then also that sodium. So the sodium was 134. 
Should we be adding in a little bit? Um, check it again. Uh, then the other thing with prolacta is that it is low on the vitamin B complex. So we use polyvisol instead of PDVIC for those B vitamins. We're going to be adding folate. Uh, it doesn't have the additional vitamin D that our regular bovine HMF has. So that's why we add additional vitamin D. Um, and then think about iron. I know it's a little bit early, but the prolacta doesn't have added iron in it either. And then you are considering polyvisol and you are considering polyvisol. So yeah, polyvisol would be for all the prolacta babies. So if you're, you would start it kind of, um, yeah, once you get like 120, like, 120, like yeah. off TPN, because you're going to be getting those vitamin minerals in there. So once the TPN is on. When, uh, when prolacta makes their fortifier, it's part of the uh, labeling regulations. They have, when you put on a label, you have to be sure it's what's in the product. When they add the vitamins to the, to the products, they can't guarantee though they will remain stable uh, free stop uh, and pasteurize. Um, so because of that, they don't add any additional vitamins to the donor. Um, the only thing that you get in there is what's inherent in mom's milk initially, and a few extra electrolytes that they are able to see for that. But there are no added vitamins in the proactive forage fire. So, which is why we have to add the multivitamin with the additional vitamin uh, and niacin. We sometimes add additional vitamin D. We are aware of the lack of iron intake, but we're also following this. By freaking, we would probably transmitting the switch device, which is a very significant dose of uh, recycled iron uh, from that. Um, so, like you were saying, earlier, uh, we're now should be starting to see that growth happening. We're on our goal nutrition. Uh, TPN has stopped. Um, we've lost kind of around probably 15% of weight. Um, and then we're going to be hoping for our goals. If you guys know growth goal growth, uh, growth goals. Uh, so just quick refresh. Prems are the 15 to 20 gram per kilo per day. Once you're over that 36, 37 weeks, you can go to 20 to 30 grams per day. Um, but we also, for little ones, will track the standard deviations. Um, so any kind of IUGR babies, will see how far they've fallen from the mean. Um, and following our front end, front end growth charts for girls. Um, and like Kimidi was saying earlier, we want to see that drop. Um, so what is our adequate growth? So for, for baby Carly, she, you know, 700 grams, she fell down. Uh, we didn't show you the fall, but we show you where she's at now. So she's pretty much back to birth weight. So whatever that percentile is now, that's where we want her to follow. Um, previously, we want them to like come back up to their birth weight percentile, but that really shouldn't start happening until they're correct in turn. Um, we know better um, and that we get better uh, a standardized growth if you're following kind of what was your lowest percentile and then tracking of that as long as it wasn't like a malnourished patient or there were other types of complications but for her we would want her to follow that percentile kind of for whatever her lowest percentile was that could be an entirely another talk <laughs> that's like yeah. kind of spent in we talk days about that one <laughs> um but that's just that quick summary. Um, a suboptimal growth, clearly from this example, um, would be you know we're born kind of between that third and tenth percentile, and we're going home well below the zero percentile. And this would be that kind of patient we would be showing what those standard deviations are. We want those lines to be falling lines. We don't want to see them slowly falling off like that. Yeah, like for this this baby boy, um, kind of the lowest looks like it was around the third percentile, and I'd want them to keep going the third percentile. They don't need to get back up above the 10, um, but definitely closer to the third percentile. So the fact that the like who is falling off along with the weight is a show it's a sign that there was some synopsis when you mm -hmm. the, Maybe not too severe, but the circumference is still bought appropriately, but I don't want to, don't want to see that too frequently. And usually in rounds, we'll point out 
if we see like, so this head circumference was tracking the third to 10, and then now it's kind of getting closer to 50. And so if we see head circumference is growing too fast, we'll just bring it to your attention and we can do with it what you want. <laughs> You know, then we usually will ask the nurse, can you still check that and measure it? Let us help you measure it um, just to make sure. Um, but we don't want to see overgrowth in that. Um, this is just kind of a main slide, just kind of showing, you know, what okay, the, the brain maturation at 23 weeks, uh, which we start to see more of, um, to 32 and then term. So, we're trying to do a lot of neurodevelopment with the nutrition that we're doing. That's what we try to do with our adults. So, anything else to add on that? Unfortunately, we can't really assess proper neurodevelopment and cognitive abilities until these patients are much older. But the best kind of evidence that we have to support that is just growth. Yeah. All right, um, so what to do if we're not growing? Can we talk a little bit about this already? Uh, the one thing we did mention is high milk feeding. So we will talk to families about high milk. Um, only when a mother has a full supply of milk and beyond. Because if we're gonna start doing high milk feeding, we're not gonna be giving that baby the first, say 20 to 30% of the breast milk, we would be freezing that and using it later on. So we're only going to be using that last, say, depending on the baby and the mom, the kind of that last 70, 80 percent of her milk. So we have to make sure she has that adequate supply. We also don't say we want you to do this because for some moms, even those that are really eager that they want to provide high milk and give the best milk, we find after they do it for a few weeks, for whatever reason, it is very stressful on them. And we actually see that they want supply sometimes does go down. I don't have the evidence to prove this, but just anecdotally, we'll have parents come and be like, and sometimes the support person be like, I don't think we should do this. So we'll keep talking. We have to just try to remember to keep talking with them and see if they can do it um, and what that stress is causing on them. The other thing, is I alluded to earlier, is that when we're feeding on a plum, we have to make sure that the syringe tip is inverted. Um, there's some really neat studies showing the fat loss over time. So this is the amount of fat in grams per 100 mils. And so uh, mother's milk without a fortifier can start around like four and a half, 4.6. And then once you run it, even on a pump after five minutes, it can drop down um, because you're getting, or do you know why that's happening? Do you know why the fat loss is happening? Uh, it kind of deposits in the line, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, like uh, when you put this syringe to the normal position, fat is going up. And just going to the baby, when yeah, it's separate. The separate. syringe is just finished, the, uh, the most uh, stain the fat. And this one is the that is going up. Yeah, going, yeah. Uh, so this picture is just coming through as clear, but you can kind of see like in the beginning that first like go around to like two, three mil line or point point two point three mil line. You can see it's much thicker and denser, mm -hmm. and then go to the bottom now, and it's a lot thinner. So your yeah. fat separating out, right? Um, and the prolactin is really bad or really good at separating because it's 100% human milk. So it does separate out um, and mother's milk separates out even more. Yeah. Um, so, you know, your fat loss, even running over 60 minutes. So you've gone from like four and a half or more to like 3.3, so a lot, yeah, quite a bit. You have fat losses um, if you're infusing it kind of a normal way. So then this is our um, human milk with the uh, human, human milk fortifier. So you are getting, again, 4.5 to about 4.6-ish, 4.7. Um, and then they have a new product called cream. So this is something that we're looking at, um, but it is basically just 
fat, um, the kind of remainder fat from the Prolacta company. They sell it now and it's approved in Canada now as just the cream. So this, this here is that you start at a much higher amount of fat um, and then you're still getting a similar fat loss amount, but then in the end, the baby is getting more. So you just add it to the mixture or okay. I thought you maybe it's, it's, it's a fat supplement. It's a fat okay. supplement. Yeah. Some centers use it, they will use it first and then follow like the, priming the, the prime, prime. Yeah. Some okay. use it as a primer. Um and some centers use it as a they just mix it in. Uh off the report. Oh, this is reported. <laughs> oh yeah, and it's 3 30 already. Um but this is uh what so this is what we want to do is infuse the pump or turn that pump up so the fat's going in first, uh, and then all the rest of the milk will follow. So when you're in the room and you're like, oh, you're on a pinch and use pump. We we try, but we sometimes we feel like police. We're like teasing your ad looking for it. But if we can have helpers to see, oh, let's make sure that. And I was wondering why some uh, infusers are like this and some infusers are, are just horizontal. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that all about it for the powder fortifiers. Yeah. Just because if they're not properly mixed, they will precipitate to the bottom. And if you start inverting those through, then you're not going to get any of the additional protein. Yeah, the powder yeah. fortifiers are different because they yeah. precipitate out from yeah. the bottom. Maybe on prolactide, I don't hesitate to get her system. Yeah. Try to invert the syringe to at least 45 degrees. Yeah. Okay, so this was a really good section. Um, we're at slide 41 and slide 54. The next steps are looking at feeding tolerance. We decided to go up on a Prolac plus eight and not change the uh, TFI. We are feeding on a pump over 60 minutes, so we're making sure that we're inverted. Um, and now we're going to start orally feeding. We're going to start sink A. So I have, we have asked Chris if we could get another time. And with, is that something you would like? I see head shakes. So that's good. <laughs> or like, not like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the next part of it is getting into sink and how we do sink with breastfeeding. Um, and then all of our different board buyers and going home and what are our formula options. So that can be what you can look forward to. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll finish off the rest of this presentation, plus we have more to share. Um, so I'm just going to skip to the very last slide. Um, we also, um, this is just a sneak Molly who is talking about neck at the next Wednesday session. I believe that's still the fun. Um, so I was going to talk a bit about that, but I will stop talking and, um, let us know that now or later or future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. This, this might be a very limited question. This first term baby, she's doing okay. Sometimes they're started on I suppose a bit prematurely. How much do you need of a feed to meet the 45 to 50 cycle cost per day? I know on like the first day they say the baby's going to take one, but how much would be added? Like growing? Yeah. Like a baby who's healthy. Well, it's the same, it's the same uh uh, I'm going to last year. Last year, it's turning. You could probably wait two, three days before starting TPS, assuming they're well. I mean, this is a baby one that we want to get off. I think so. We want to make sure they're thinking orally at it. Sure, to send back to the mom. Those are farmers only parental, huh? Oh, parental. Yeah. Yeah. A, term, a term infant's going to take a few days before they actually adequately. Yeah. I don't think breast breastfeeding is going to take a few days before they're really one hundred percent of their it's the first days, it's just balancing ins and outs, weight, uh, adequate weight loss. And then over after few days, they'll be consuming hopefully about 100 calories per kilo, getting a, about two grams per kilo of strong So it can take a few days. You, you don't expect that on day one. In my unit. And, and business? 
recording. Stop recording. So you can stop recording. Do you want to start? Is there anybody left online? Just make a I think the Nia's had a session. I know we started. <laughs> you can just you can stop recording. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can yeah, just click this.